I, I was afraid this topic they selected for me might be too boring, but I'm very pleased, and I thank you very much for all showing up. It's very nice of you. Uh, ever since the energy crisis of the 70s, uh, Western or progressive societies have tried to produce more with less. So w with that thought in mind, that's what efficiency is all about to try to, uh, what, what you input something, to try to get as much output of it as you can. So that's what we're going to talk about, with specifically uh, related to electric machines. And I, I used to call, I, I would say electric motors, but generators are so important these days that I have to use the term electric machines, because all the electricity, except from two sources, comes from generators. Don't ever forget that. And they're, they're just a, uh, a generator, is just an electric motor with the powerful power flow reversed. So uh, if we go back to uh, many, many years ago in 1888, uh, uh, I guess that's right, 1888, the, the first induction motor model wa uh, was invented, or the first one produced was by uh, Tesla many, many years ago. And the picture on the right shows a more modern looking induction motor. And these motors are powered by the line or the grid. And they're all fixed frequency. In Europe, it's 50 hertz, as you all know. In the United States, North America, it's 60 hertz. So, so uh, <clears throat> with, uh, with the uh, emphasis on improving efficiency, there's two ways to get that into the market. One is to try to use uh, market-based competitive uh, points, talking points to get customers to buy induction motors with high efficiency or the other, if that doesn't work, then you have to legislate it. And what has happened over the last uh, 25 years is the, the market forces haven't worked very well because uh, if, if you're going to produce a motor with the old efficiency and, and, alongside, uh, and offer that alongside one with higher efficiency, in a manufacturing plant that uses hundreds of motors for pumps and various uh, processes, if uh, he's going to go with the lowest price motor, which he didn't care about efficiency because he has a budget for maintenance, so he's going to go with the lowest price motor. And the, the market pressures try to get the, uh, uh, the, this uh, maintenance guy to realize that if he pays the extra price for the high efficiency motor, there'll be a payback in a year, or two or three, but he didn't really care about that. So that hasn't worked too well. And that would take a long time if it did because you would only put high efficient motors in instances where you had a failure of an old motor. Of course, all new machinery might use high efficient motors. So we kind of gave up on that and uh, uh, went with uh, the government mandated efficiency standards. And, and just to put in perspective what, uh, what the electricity consumption is, at least in America, uh, you look, 38% of, uh, of the motor industry is single phase motors, and that's very important. We're gonna talk about the difference between efficiency of single phase and three phase. And um, commercial motor market, of course, is nearly all three phase motors. And uh, industrial mark, market is also three-phase motors. So uh, let's just look at the residential business for a minute. The, uh, I don't know if Europe is the same as the United States, but all this information is based on American uh, market sizes, and the Department of Energy provides this data. And we, we use a lot of air conditioning in America because the southern United States and the western United States and so on, it's very hot and humid, so everybody has an air conditioner. So that consumes an awful lot of electricity. And these are all single-phase motors in residential. And uh, that's a big slice of this pie. Uh, appliances in the kitchen, like the refrigerator, runs 24-7, 365 days, 300, yeah, all year. Every, it never stops. So the efficiency of a refrigerator is very important. Washing machines is intermittent duty, cooling fans, uh, uh, dryers, home uh, laundry equipment, small appliances, intermittent duty. So the, uh, if you were to tackle the efficiency of those, it wouldn't have a big impact on energy consumption anywhere. But uh, 
so I, I guess everybody knows what efficiency really is. Machines convert energy from uh, motor converts from mechanical to electrical, and generators convert from, uh, no, generators convert from mechanical, mechanical to electrical. Forgive me for talking fast, but I've only got 40 minutes to do this, <laughs> and it ain't gonna be easy. <laughs> so uh, I'll try to slow down a little bit. But uh, uh, there's losses when you convert energy, and here's a kind of a breakdown of some of the losses. Uh, <clears throat> and different people who study these breakdowns come up with different numbers, and I've got a couple of different slides uh, uh, showing it. So if you're going to tackle the efficiency of a motor, you would tackle the, the you know, pick the, pick the, the chair, the low-hanging fruit, as they say. Okay, so you pick the ones that are the easiest to reduce and, and have the biggest number to uh, reduce. Stray load losses, we don't pay a lot of attention to because to improve the losses in that, you've got to do a new lamb design, and that's not so happy. But uh, certainly core losses we can reduce by using more expensive steels. Now, what's interesting about the, when the high, higher efficiency motors came out, what was interesting about them is maybe the additional manufacturing cost was 20%. But since it was such a payback on these in 50, 100 kilowatt and bigger motors, why the, the manufacturers all, uh, independently decided to charge a 50% premium and make more profit on higher efficient ones than they did the other ones. They don't do that now, but they did originally. But uh, so uh, now to reduce the I squared R losses in the stator, that's a little tougher because you're stuck with the, this winding equipment you see here. And so to reduce the losses, you have to increase the wire diameter, heavier gauge, and try to reduce the interns, particularly on two-pole and four-pole motors, as interns are very big and those contribute to I-squared losses, but they don't contribute anything to output power. So, uh, so uh, a lot of the equipment and machinery has to be modified, and manufacturing engineers, they don't like that. So they'll, they'll try other things before that. Another area is uh, the fan designs. The, the cooling fans, the overcooling fans, uh, have to be bi-directional, so you can't use the high-efficient reverse, uh, reverse blades they use on turbines, but uh, there are some things you can do to improve the efficiency of the fan to reduce the parasitic losses from cooling the machine. Um, here, here's a nice breakdown. I like this breakdown to give you some idea what the, how big the, uh, the cherries are, which cherries you want to pick first. And, and one thing to point out here is the rotor loss is 25%, uh, let's say. But if you use a permanent magnet machine, that number's zero. So that's, uh, let's keep that in mind for a few slides later. Uh, this is another study. ESA is the Motor Rewind Organization, Motor Repair Organization. This is their slide. By the way, I think all these are gonna be available to you. I don't know how you get them, but uh, I believe they're available. So I don't have time to, to stay on them very long. We don't have enough time. But um, the uh, adoption of high efficiency motors took a long time. It didn't, not much happened in the United States at least. I don't really know about Europe. So, so the governments got together, politicians got together and decided to mandate higher efficient motors. So, uh, NEMA, the motor organization in the United States, and the one in Europe called IE International. What, what does IE stand for? International Efficiency? What, what is it? Okay. Well, they, they finally have gotten together and kind of agreed on a similar standard. Uh, I think most of the uh, most of the points of that standard are on the IE side, and NEMA's kind of gone along with them all. So these have been started to implement around the, around the world. And there's some dates here of when uh, certain ones have been implemented in certain parts of the world. We, we don't have to study those, but this is an interesting chart, very important chart. Let's look at this a minute. This is the, uh, a plot of the efficiencies in percentage versus the output power of the machine. And uh, I've, uh, I've taken and put on here this vertical blue line uh, what separates single-phase and three-phase motors. There's probably some overlap there, 
But, but as you could see, in the lower powered uh, machines, there's uh, no way you can get very high efficient motors in any, uh, no matter how many phases you have. The efficiency is better as the motor gets bigger. We all know that. But uh, it's really bad in the single phase motors. And I have another chart that published by uh, Baldor or somebody that really compares what the actual numbers are. And um, uh, so the, uh, here's the four standards, the same four standards that are on this chart. And uh, at the end of this, I don't have, well, we'll have time to go over them, but at the end of this presentation, I show an example of uh, a, a project that I did last year to take a 1950 uh, lamination that met the, uh, the IE1 standard and, and went through the simulation steps of what would it take to modify that motor design uh, to, to get it up to IE2, IE3, and you could never make it to IE4. But uh, <clears throat> so it was kind of interesting to see what the choices are. Uh, so there's some overlapping that you can uh, improve the copper enough, but that uh, reduce the I square R loss enough, but that might not be a happy manufacturing solution. So, so it might be better to pay for uh, more expensive steel. Uh, those kind of trade-offs are are studied. I, we probably won't have time to go over those, but they're all included in the slides. You can look at them. Um, I can't read these, but. Uh, What's important about the latest standards, the standards that, uh, for, that have been uh, adopted in 2014, are the exceptions. The following situations, or the following types of, of line start machines aren't covered by these standards. So this whole thing seems like a political mess to me because eight pole motors aren't covered because an, an eight pole induction motor has a terrible power factor because the leakage reactance is so high. So it has a terrible power factor and could never meet these, uh, sta this standard. So, so they just scratched it from the requirement. And the same thing is true with pole changing motors. And, and uh, of course, synchronous motors don't, are, are not covered by this standard. And uh, motors for intermittent duty, only motors for uh, S1 or continuous duty. And remember, those efficiency standards are only at one speed and frequency for line run motors. <clears throat> and what about motors that have been designed specifically for inverters? They're not covered in these standards either. And single phase motors are not covered. And that's one of the big, big cherries we could pick to have an effect on, uh, on improving efficiency. So how has the industry dealt with that? Well. That's interesting what they've done. Uh, this is that chart that I was talking about from, uh, from uh, Baldor that shows a, uh, a premium efficiency single phase motor uh, values f based on horsepower. Forgive horsepower, but they're an American company, so they use horsepower instead of kilowatts. So, so here's a single phase induction motor. But here's a, what, what they tried to do a premium efficient single phase induction motor. So, so, so you could see you still, it's a big improvement, but you never get close to the three phase machine. And what do you have to do to get to, quote, a premium efficient induction single phase motor? Well, you have to stuff lots of copper in it. You gotta use better steel, but even that won't do it. You have to use a big capacitor. And because a single phase motor, is a single phase motor a single phase motor? Who can tell me, is that really a single phase motor? How many phases, how many winding phases in a single phase induction motor? Two, right. So it's not really a single phase motor, it's a two phase motor. But it's powered by sing, from single phase grid power, see? So that's kind of kooky. But that's why its efficiency can never be as good as a, uh, uh, three-phase motor. And <clears throat> capacitors don't last very long, so that's a reliability issue. So uh, what have they done with appliances like HVAC and, and refrigerators and washing machines and all these things for the home? The only way they can uh, get the efficiency down is to change to a three-phase motor. And what do they have to do? They have to put an inverter on it. So we have to rectify the 
the single phase AC and regenerate uh, three phase. And that's what they've done. And so, but there's no IE standard on that, so they've done it another way. In every industry, they do it a little different. Uh, like for white goods appliances in the United States, we've defined uh, the uh, Energy Star compliance, we call it. Energy Star compliance. I don't know who dreamed that up. But what that means is every, every appliance will have a, a sticker on it that tells you what the average annual operating cost is. So when, you, when your wife, you and your wife go in a store and you look at a washing machine or a refrigerator, you look at this yellow sticker and they, they, the government thinks that you're going to pick the model based on the number on that sticker. And that's not true. I don't think anybody pays any attention to that sticker. Most people don't. Young, green people do. But people my age and most of your age, they don't pay any attention to that. They, they buy appliances that look nice. They're pretty. They have refrigerators, got an ice maker or a, or a, TV, a, a TV in the door. Have you seen that? We sell refrigerators with TVs in the door. Anyway. So, <clears throat> so uh, that's the kind of the standard that's used for white good appliances. And when it comes to air conditioners and heating system, they use a different system. They, they use a SEER rating, S-E-E-R. I should know what that stands for, but I don't know. It's an acronym for what this is trying to do. And there, someone knows, I suppose, but that's supposed to uh, tell the consumer uh, the higher the number, the less uh, energy you're going to burn in a year to heat your house. Or, but it's not just the motor. There's other things associated with that. Like a heat pump is a reverse cycle refrigeration unit. You pump, pump the freon one way, and it puts, makes the ho house hot. You pump the freon the other way, and it makes the house cold. So, so it's got to have a compressor motor. So they use a three-phase compressor motor in that with all the uh, electronics and the built-in uh, uh, in, inside of a hermetic compressor, and, and uh, that contributes to this sear rating, but there's no standard on the motor itself. Now, in the case of a washing machine, it's a, uh, oh, oh, this is interesting. The, the, the government has mandated sear values for different parts of the country. They've taken the United States and divided up uh, based a lot on the temperature, the average temperature, and, and they've implemented that when the uh, air conditioning company can sell a, uh, an air conditioner or a heating system or a heat pump, excuse me, uh, depending, uh, all designed to uh, uh, minimize the use of energy is what it is. So some parts of the country, if you buy a new air conditioner, can have a 14 sear. Another part of the country has got to be a 16 sear, that type of thing. But so th that's not an IE standard, you understand. It's kind of a, a requirement, a government regulation for the product that includes all of the things that you could do inside that product to reduce the energy consumption. That's really. Now let's look at uh, major appliances. <clears throat> we, I already mentioned that uh, some things about major appliances 24 7. You know, ever since the energy crunch, of the 70s, Americans like to have this ugly ceiling fan in the, in the center of every room in their house. And I don't know what they think they're doing. The original ceiling fan motors were shaded pole single phase motors. Maximum of efficiency, 30%. So for every dollar spent for electricity, you get 30, 30 cents worth of air movement, okay? Now, if you have a seven-room house, and you got one of those in every room, and you have those all at the same time, you're going to use more electricity than if you run your heat pump and cool the house, OK? Because the heat pump is very efficient, and those fans are not. Now, now they don't use those anymore. They use permanent magnet brushless motors for those with electronics on them and so on. So they've gotten better. But, uh, uh, but I think it's market, uh, market pressure that's forced that. But I'll give you another crazy example that blows my mind. In the bath, in your bathroom, there's, uh, I think, uh, all over the world, you have a blower in the bathroom, right? So that uh, when you go in the bathroom, turn the light switch, this blower comes on. When you leave the bathroom, turn the light off, the blower turns off. Well, that had one of these shaded pole motors in it. Who cares? But Panasonic came out with a brushless ceiling fan motor that cost like 
in the United States, $250 for $300 for this thing, whereas the old shaded pole motor was 1995. And so the contractors building new condos and apartments are putting that Panasonic in there along with other things and call it green living, green house. Even their brochures are all green. You know what color we paint our Toyota Prius taxi cabs in California? Green. <laughs> anyway. You know, we're really hung up on green, so that helps all this, that's for sure. But so uh, there's a lot of switch reluctance motors used for, for, not a lot, but some switch reluctance motors used because they don't use magnets. You know, magnet prices went up, so, so people are looking at uh, <coughs> switch reluctance motors and reluctant synchronous motors. But uh, what I want to show you now is uh, with all these motors, there's a nameplate issue involved with these. And I've been involved with this myself. If you, if it, let's go back to the grid motors, the line motors that uh, run off the line, there's regulations for, uh, for IEC and also NEMA of what goes on that nameplate. There's certain things you have to have on that nameplate because uh, an electrician, if he's gonna wire that up on a machine or, or he's gonna repair it in an appliance, he, he's, he'll check the nameplate to make sure that uh, what the current draw is, so he's got big enough wire and all of these issues. So you have to have the AC motor, you have to have the voltage and the frequency and the number of phases, you have to have that on there. Well, wh how do you deal with the information on a nameplate when it's not powered off the line? How do you deal with it when it's powered off a box of electronics? And sometimes the electronics is attached to the motor, it's integral in the motor, and other times it isn't, it's separate. So that's a nameplate issue, and here's a few uh, there's a, uh, a washing machine that says high-speed induction auto washer. It's not an automobile washer. I don't know why auto is there. That's a uh, uh, clothes washer. And what does this other one say? I can't even read it. Uh, this one just said, oh, that says use in automatic clothes washers only. Auto means automatic because they don't have room for the whole word on a nameplate. So that's how they deal with it. And there's a picture on the right of a, of a washing machine with the electronic mounted right on the back of it, see? So, but there's not, there's not much in there. Look at that, 380 hertz, 250 volts. We don't have 380 hertz in my house. I don't know about yours. Uh, variable speeds, blah, 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 class F insulation. But not every, there's no standard on this, so other people do it differently. What is this one? Oh, this is the... Uh, the air circulator in an in American home uh, heating or air conditioning. Now, in Germany, you use a lot of hydronic heating systems. That's boilers uh, heating hot water. We only use those in New England in the United States. The five, six New England states use new, uh, hydronic heating systems, but nowhere else in the United States do they use them. They use forced air systems because how do you put an air conditioning system in a hydronic system? Because there's no ductwork. Yeah, you know, so you, you can't, it's really expensive to air condition a hydronic heated. So, so they, they have a different uh, bunch of stuff, information on the nameplate for, for these motors because usually the box of electronics is not attached to the motor like it is in a washing machine. So, <clears throat> so uh, here's, a, here's another example. Uh, automatic washer, half horsepower. Uh, that, oh, there's another one, auto washer. It seems like they all use auto washers. This is a switch reluctance washing machine motor where the other ones are induction. Now what's interesting about this is uh, General Electric White Goods Appliance a few months ago just sold out to Electrolux in Cleveland. GE sold the whole white goods appliance business lock, stock, and barrel to Electrolux. And, GE has nine different models of home washing machines, and eight of those have electronically controlled variable speed three-phase motors in them. Only one of them has the old-fashioned single-phase motor in it. And some of those three-phase uh, electronically controlled motors are, are brush permanent magnet, and some of them are induction. I don't know how they decide which one, but so th that market is really changing and it's having a major impact on the energy consumption in a home by getting rid of single phase motors and replacing them with polyphase motors electronically driven. Uh, oh, this is the air handler motor. 
The one on the right's an air handler, uh, a single speed air handler motor. The one on the left is an air handler motor with the, the electronics uh, growth hanging onto the back of it. And uh, it, it has a completely different type of a nameplate on it. So the point is that IE, NEMA, and the governments have nothing to do with these kind of motors at all. They have no control over them all, except for the efficiency requirement, the energy consumption requirement of the devices they go in, OK? And, and that's good in a way, because that leaves a lot of discretion up to the manufacturer as to how he's going to achieve those uh, energy consumption requirements. And this is uh, a study I did at ICM, ICEM last year, uh, where I uh, used a software product to, to uh, model a 1950s design motor. And, uh, and these are all the strategies for uh, improving the efficiency. Most of you know these already. There's no, there's no rocket science in this. Uh, you, you use uh, laminated electrical steels with, core lo with lower core losses or annealed lamination materials, thinner gauge. All this costs more, though. Uh, <clears throat> wind the phase coils, as I said before, with, sh with shorter coils, shorter end turns. Now, the, the, the winder, automation winder people, they don't like that because if you make the coils too short when, you're, when you wind them and insert them, that sometimes the machines will jam and it gives you downtime and they got to fix it, see? So they don't like to have short coils. But, and the only way you're going to do it is if government says you got to do it. So that's really what's happening. And uh, uh, increase the wire gauge, uh, higher slot fills. Uh, Ford Motor Company uh, makes a traction motor for their cars and they have a very high slot fill. I have pictures of it. It's incredible the slot fill they get because they, they use the commercial winding equipment, the, the skein winders and the, and the finger insertion equipment. It's all the same equipment, but, but they'll drop some of the turns, they'll wind some of the turns, drop them in, and then they drift them in, D-R-I-F-T. That means they have tooling, extra tooling, an extra station that jams those conductors into the bottom of the slots and fingers that pull them and hold them tight while the next group is dropped in, they, and they have new drifting dies, different shape that jam those in and pull those back. Very complicated tooling. I don't know how many times it jams, but they get incredible uh, slot fills with use, using the present automation equipment by modifying it. Probably other companies have done it too, but. Uh, then, then, of course, uh, redesign the cooling fans. Uh, and convert single phase to three phase with inverters. Now, there's one interesting aspect of single phase motors that that's, I think is very exciting, and that's a line start synchronous motor. Let's take an induction motor with the squirrel cage in it, and let's change the die and put some slots in the punching right underneath the squirrel cage and put some magnets in there. So now what you have, you don't need a box of electronics. You, uh, all you do is line start the motor, and when the motor gets, it's slipping to get up to speed. Uh, slipping means that the rotor speed is not the same speed as the 60 hertz rotation of the electric field in the stator. So it gets up close to synchronous speed, and then the magnet flux locks it into sync, and the efficiency takes a big jump because you're not using that capacitor anymore. You see? So, <clears throat> and uh, the Japanese use these kind of motors for, uh, for air conditioners, for those little units that uh, hang on the outside of buildings, you know, Samsung and, and Sharp and people like that, Panasonic, they make these things, and they use line start permanent mag or line start synchronous motors. They have some permanent magnets inside them, but you don't need any electronics. So that's an interesting technology that's certainly worth, uh, worth consideration. So, uh, so this is this design example that we did. I'm not going to read all this, but we started with a with a, a, a lamb from Keenly and Spies. That's the company here. It's an old lamination of the 50s and the 60s. 
and, and it was a lamb that they list for an IEC 225 frame, okay? If anybody is familiar with that, that's, that's kind of like a, a NEMA 326 frame for those Americans who know anything about frames. And um, so, so what we did, we used the motor simulation software to uh, model that for its, uh, uh, its uh, performance. And, and uh, we used the uh, steel loss data from the steel, that comes from the electrical steel companies, which is a problem in itself because it, <clears throat> it's found out years ago that if you use the loss data for electrical steels published by the steel companies, you build the motor and you test it, your, loss, your iron loss has come out much higher. And it'll vary from size of the motor. And, and the reason for this is that the manufacturing of the core adds losses to the finished core. Like if you weld the core or you cleat it or you rivet it, uh, that adds uh, losses. So the losses come out much higher. So in your simulation software, you have to put a calibration factor or a fudge factor in there based on some real measurements so that you can use that uh, for the next one. However, that's not all good because there's a company here called Brockhaus. People know this company, a German company. They make, uh, pardon? They have a stand. No, they have a stand right there, yeah. If you look, I encourage you to go over there and look at their stand because they show a, a stator, uh, they're making measurements of the core losses in a finished core and comparing that. And I've done that myself. I provide that as a, as a service to customers. I took uh, 20 motors from Chevrolet Volt, you know, the electric General Motors car. I took 20 stators from that. They were burnout stators that they sent me. And uh, so I took all the windings out and I put a primary and a secondary around the stator and weighed it very carefully and all this stuff. And, and I sent them to, uh, sent these, shipped these stators to Concordia University in Montreal. And Dr. Pillay has all this equipment and he measured the core losses. And so we made a big report and sent that to General Motors. But the interesting thing about it was that all 20 of these were made on the same automated production line. But the core loss wasn't the same, it varied 20% from one to the other. Tremendous variation, even with the same production line. That was an amazing, amazing discovery. I don't know the cause. I guess the variation in the core manufacturing process is what caused that. It's the only thing I can conclude. So uh, anyway, this thing uh, uh, had a 340-millimeter uh, diameter stator, 213-millimeter diameter rotor, 240 millimeter long core and uh, 0.85 millimeter air gap. That was that was the machine we modeled, and uh, uh, so our first goal was to try to meet IE2 standards, and then IE3, and then IE4. But we really couldn't meet IE4 with this. You have to use permanent magnets. If you have permanent magnets, once you synchronize the motor, unless it's a line start motor, you're going to have to have inverter. And that's exempt, the inverter-driven motors are exempt from the, from the standard anyway. So why bother worrying about it? And yet, many startup motor companies that have some new creative motor technology will advertise and claim that they meet IE4 standards, which isn't even a requirement, but those motors all require an inverter. It's kind of crazy, but so I guess it's an advertising ploy, if nothing else. So. Uh, what did we do for the meet IE2? We used lower cost silicon. We, we went from, uh, from a uh, very low cost commercial grade electrical steel that was very pure but didn't have silicon in it. That's what the original was. And we went to a uh, 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 roughly a 3% silicon content steel that had, I don't know, about a third of the losses at 60 hertz, 50, 60 hertz, something like that. and. Uh, and then we, uh, to meet IE3, we increased the slot fill and, and increased the, decreased the end turn height, used the same electrical steel. And uh, actually, uh, you could uh, play around with whether you use aluminum or copper, too, <coughs> in the rotor. That, that'll affect your efficiency 1.5%, 2%, depending on the size of the motor. Uh, there's been a major breakthrough in die casting of copper. How many of you are aware of that? A French company 
has developed the technology to design and build reliable, long enough lasting die casting dies to die cast copper. And I consider this a very important achievement. There's uh, probably, they probably do it in China and Japan now. There's an American company in Ohio, can't think of their name, but they've developed themselves without taking a license from the French. But there's a lot of uh, motors now that use uh, copper die cast rotors. Uh, if you tour around here, you'll see some very interesting fabrication methods for, I think there's a booth right there. Uh, did any of you heard of stir welding? It's, you know, like your wife is stirring a pot, stir welding. This is a fantastic way to make a copper rotor. Airplanes are made that way. If you, if you take two plates of aluminum and put them together and clamp them down, and you use a special end mill that doesn't cut. It's just got a blunt end little point on it. And you spin this at high speed and apply pressure. The, the friction of that will melt the aluminum. And then you feed it, and it melts and alloys that together. And that's the way they, they fasten pieces together on airplanes. If you, next time you take a flight, you look out the window down the wing. Years ago, you used to see thousands of rivets and screws uh, holding the pieces together. Now they machine those out of solid billets of aluminum with the skin tapered as you go out to the end, and then they'll butt those together and spin and uh, stir weld them together. It's an amazing technology. Well, they do that with copper now. So, so if you have copper bars that you extrude, put them in and, and assemble them in the slots, and then you have an, a big copper end ring with slots in it that fit that, then you stir well the OD. You just melt, melt all that together on the OD. Uh, General Motors has a patent on it. Hitachi has a patent on it. But they're easy to get around the patents. All you got to do is change the angle of the tool and the speed and the feed and you get around the patent. But there's companies that are exhibiting here that do that. Okay? So that, that's a fantastic technology for getting a copper. Otherwise, if you're going to fabricate them the old-fashioned way, now the copper rotor induction motor costs almost as much as the PM synchronous machine, you see? So either die casting or spin extruding and spin welding can mitigate that uh, cost delta somewhat. So I think I'm probably, am I out of time yet? Well, anyway, we, we started to model these. That's the, the cross section of the machine and, and uh, that's the torque speed curve. That's uh, uh, we don't really have time to look, performance summary. That's this for the IE1. Uh, there's uh, all the curves for the IE1, IE1, the efficiency to current. Uh, okay. And there's uh, this is the same thing for the IE2, but. But of course, we uh, we we fill the slots more and shorten the interns, and uh, somewhere uh, that's the new torque speed curve and the data, and uh, that's all the other plots. As you could see here, you have the the calculated versus the spec. Okay, and then I think. I think there's uh, uh, somewhere I believe there's a comparison of the aluminum one and the copper one here. I'm not sure where it is, but okay. So anyway, let's uh, let's go here. Uh, dumb motors. Our motors are powered off the line. Smart motors are. Motors that are powered by uh, microprocessors. So uh, smart motors uh, uh, get maybe get their initial power from the grid, but uh, that power has to be converted to, to DC back to AC through a, through a converter, an inverter. What do you call it for a generator? It's called a converter, and for a motor, it's called an inverter. I guess I don't know. So somebody told me that once, but. Uh, Sometimes the only uh, regulation, the bottom line here is it's taken government regulation to make this happen. That's really the bottom line, what I have to say.